I want you to bless him from your heart this morning. Forget all else. We're just instructed to focus on Jesus. So I want you to do it. I want you to do it. I want you to do what we've just been instructed to do. It came in a song, but it was an instruction to focus on Jesus. We bless you, O God. We bless you, O God. We bless you. We bless you. Before we go into the world today, I have a clear instruction in my heart. Can you just put up um, Isaiah 53? Isaiah 53. If you are that person, I want you to know that um, the reason why God put this in my heart is to let you know he's aware of what is going on. The odds, the pains, and the things you're going through. One of the things you have to know is that it's not common. Uh, it's not just something that is special that is happening to you. Christ also went through all the things that you are facing right now. Isaiah 53, verse 3. Bible says he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. But look at verse 4. Verse 3 seems to be describing what he went through. And then we are wondering, what is the purpose of this? Why did he go through all that he went through? Verse 4 says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for what? Our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Lift up your hands and bless him this morning. Just adore him. Just adore him. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. The Bible says we do not have a high priest who doesn't know what we are going through. So we do not have a high priest who is not touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He knows. He knows the pains. He knows the odds. He knows the disappointments. He knows the shortcomings. He knows when we don't measure up. He knows when we ought to do something, but we can't find the strength to do it. He knows when we are abused. He knows when we were in that dark place. He knows because he went through the same. And I'm just telling you now that the life of God is flowing into your heart this moment. The heart the life of God is flowing into your heart this moment. Bringing healing. Bringing healing. Bringing healing. Bringing healing. Bringing healing. You see, it's a river. So it's flowing. It's flowing through your systems. Going to the deceased parts and restoring those parts back to how they used to be. Let him touch you. Let him heal you. Let him do it. No man can do it. Man is limited by time and space. But God is not limited at all. That's why the Bible says he dwells in a place of unapproachable light whom no man had seen or can see. The writer of that passage was trying to describe a God that lives in eternity. He was trying to contrast his existence from ours. He was trying to focus our attention on the reality of God who is not limited by time and space. Let him heal your heart. This is what this place is for. Church is a place of healing. 
Church is a place of restoration. Church is a place of instruction. Church is a place where you are lifted. Church is a place where you are equipped. Church is a place where you are built up. You dwell with other believers. And so Paul will write, greet Aquila and Priscilla, men who have oftentimes laid down their necks for my sake. Greet also the church that meets in their house. For you see, when we come together, we don't just discuss football. We don't just discuss the things that are important to us. Football is okay. Politics is okay. But we also share the word because we know we are the church. And so Paul said, Greet Aquila and Priscilla and the church that meets in their house. Because when they come together, they share the word. When they come together, they share the word. They share the word. And that word brings healing, brings strength, establishes us in the truth. We give you thanks, Father. Thank you for your healing touch this morning. He touched me. He touched me. And I know what joy something something I Two more times, can we sing that song? Prophetically, let's sing it. Yes. Yes. Say it Let him do his work. Me. Let him do his he work. He touched me. He touched me. Oh, I know oh, what joy the feeling is. And something happened. Just something happened. 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 flow through you this morning that woman said if I may but touch the hem of his garment I'll be made whole the woman reached out to touch him how much more when the hand of the almighty is resting on you when his hand is resting on you bringing assurance bringing strength We well, thank you, Father. Lord, we bless your name, O oh God. We we'll thank you for another opportunity to camp around your word. Lord, we know that your word is profitable. Prophet talks about addition. Prophet talks about what you didn't have before, but now you have. You traded and you made gains. It wasn't there before, but as a result of your trading, of that activity, you received, as it were, profit. So the word of God, the Bible says, the word is profitable. It's profitable. You are not here in vain. The word is profitable. It's bringing additions to your life. He's filling the gaps that exist. He's filling the void that exists. And he's correcting the things that are amiss or lacking in your life. Lord, we thank you this morning and we pray, oh God, that every heart will be open 
Every year also will be open. To hear and to do your instructions in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we will not only hear, but we will see the word this morning in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that your word will not be hindered, not by me, not by anyone, but to flow like river of living water into the hearts of everyone this morning. In the name of Jesus. Give you praise, Father. Hallelujah. Amen. You may have your seats. God bless you. It's Masterpiece Choir. Thank you so much. Let me celebrate them. Hallelujah. We don't look like what we've gone through and what we are going through. I'm just led to say this, you know. Um, August came up here this morning and gave us the charge. And many of you won't even know there was anything wrong and all that. But you know, this morning she received a very terrible news of a dear friend who died in an accident. And she was there in the car just crying and crying and crying. And the husband was concerned and said, I'm not even sure she'll be able to give the charge. But in my heart, I was praying that this is part of her story. It's not going to be all going to be rosy. It's not every time that everything will be fine. But we must keep our focus that in the midst of the pain, it's okay. I was waiting. I was clapping this morning not to encourage her. I was clapping because I was excited. That in spite of that news, she knows the word of God must not be fettered. Instead of, I mean, that the people has, must be blessed. No matter what you're going through. Hallelujah. I'm just saying that to encourage your heart. Nothing should stop you. You see, the word is more important than any other thing. If God will open our eyes to see deeper into what is really going on, you will see that this world and everything in it, <laughs> they are not, it's not enough to stop us. Hallelujah. They are not, not enough to stop us. Amen. So good to see everyone this morning. I'm so excited to see you all. I'm going to take it cool. Yeah, I'll be gentle. I will pick my words carefully. I will try to illustrate when I have to illustrate. Hallelujah. Amen. And I believe that because what I believe what I have to share this morning is very important. Since the beginning of the year, we've been talking about focus. And thank you, choir. Thank you, all the people that have come up to lead prayers, always keeping that in our hearts. And I'm just going to continue. When I started a series actually on focus, an officer and a gentleman was supposed to just be a message. <laughs> But the each other turned it to the series title, and it's okay. This morning, um, I want to share with us on what I've titled Global Positioning. Hallelujah. Someone is asking, are you still talking about an officer and a, a gentleman? Yes, Global Positioning. You see, I was reading about GPS, Global Positioning System, and I realized that it was developed in 1973 by the U.S. military, for the U.S. military, and it was released in the 80s for the civilians to start using and all that. And they make use of it in delivering supplies to soldiers in the battlefront. They use it to locate uh, a particular where uh, they are supposed to, I mean, maybe the aircraft is supposed to land and things like that. You know, it's been very, very useful. As I was thinking about it, I asked myself, what if you've been given the coordinates that the supplies are coming because you've run out of supplies as a soldier and then they give you, is it coordinates that, that's what it's called? You are to be in a particular place because that is where the helicopter will come down. And you are several kilometers away. What do you do? You ensure 
that you find yourself in that location. Because if you are in another location, the, sub, the, the aircraft will come down, but you are not there. The supplies have been given, but you are not there. Hallelujah. So I began to look at it. That you see, as believers also, I'm trying to draw similarities because each church is forcing me to see the link between the two. Hallelujah. What we are going to be talking about this morning is very, 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 very important. Hallelujah. It borders around purpose. I, I was reading something that was written by, I don't know if Einstein was an atheist, I'm not sure. But he wrote something, he said, unless you assume a meaning for what is going on around you, the world, uh, sorry, unless you assume a purpose for what is going on, everything around you won't make sense. In other words, the first thing you do is to give purpose to what you are doing, then things around you will begin to make sense. Does that make sense to us? Okay, things around you will begin to make sense. Hallelujah. So this morning, this is very important. Uh, they said, um, purpose-driven life written by Rick Warren. That's not what I'm teaching. <laughs> it's, one of, it's not just the most popular, but it's one of the highest, what do you call it, grossing or, yeah, uh, books in the world, if not the next book to the Bible. Because every man, whether you are a Muslim, a Buddhist, or whatever, what everybody is looking for is purpose. Everybody wants a sense of purpose. Everybody wants to be able to answer the question, why am I here? What am I doing here? What am I supposed to be doing? Hallelujah. That is what everybody is trying to answer. And so when you write or you teach about purpose, people had better listen because that is where it all starts from. Amen. The moment a man understands purpose, that man can stay on his own lane. The reason why people leave their lane is because they do not have a sense of purpose. They don't understand. So the grass looks greener on the other side. There is envy. Now, people don't really set out to envy people. But the reason why they envy is because in their own lives they have not found purpose. And so when they see a man living according to purpose, they envy him. It doesn't matter if they have a billion dollars and that man has few thousands. It doesn't matter. They just see a man who is in purpose and they envy the man. Why? It's because they realize there is something this man has that I do not have. Hallelujah. So the Bible says in, um, turn your Bibles to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Hallelujah. Can you just whisper a prayer for me this morning? <laughs> Amen. Pastor is always praying for people. Pray for me this morning. Amen. Psalm 33. Hallelujah. I want to start reading from um, uh, Wow. I have here from 1 to 22, but I don't want to read the entire thing. Okay, let's start. Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of what? No effect. The counsel of the Lord stands how long? Forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Now, this is where I'm going, verse 13. The Lord looks. Tell your neighbor, the Lord looks. The Lord looks. We're going to see what the Lord sees when he looks. 
The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions what? Their hearts. Individually. He considers all their works. He fashions their hearts individually and he considers their works. Hallelujah. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. <laughs> Hallelujah. Proverbs 19.21 says, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, is the Lord's what? Counsel that we what? That we stand. Let me just start this morning by saying that God has a purpose for everything he has created. That is where to start from. God has a purpose, a reason for creation, creating everything he has created. He has an intention. He has a plan for creating everything he has created. There is nothing that you see in creation that God did not think about before creating it. Because everything fits into the plan of God. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor everything has a purpose. Including me. Hallelujah. It's very important for us to know that the Bible says God looks down from heaven and he sees men. He sees the actions of men. He looks down from the place of his dwelling and the Bible says he sees the men he has created. He said their hearts were created out individually. Individually. Now, I want you to know that God is the God of the universe. That is correct. But God is also the God of the individual. He's also your God. Now, we are, I'm talking this morning to people of faith. Now, and it's very, very important because one of the major things we have to understand in this faith walk is the fact that I was called alone by God. Called alone. You were not called as a company. You were called alone. There is a purpose we are trying to achieve as um, the baptizing church Abuja. There is something we are trying to do. We have a plan. There is a focus. Focus. We pray consist, I mean, every time to ensure that we stay at the center of the will of God for us as a church. That is general. But you see, every member of the baptizing church must also discover what God has called them to do as a person. And this message this morning is to show you how. The message this morning is to show you how. Because there are certain things you must commit yourself to that we not normally, uh, that, that we definitely, without failing, bring you squarely into the plan and the purpose of God for you. And I'm going to show you the scriptures. You, you know it, but I'm going to show you. Perhaps we see it in a different light. Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah 51. Let me just show you. You see, because when you talk about faith, the place to start is with our father who? Abraham. Abraham is the father of faith. When you talk about faith, the good place to start from is Abraham. And it will amaze you that Isaiah 51 here says that we should look. Isn't it amazing? This is the year to focus. To look. Isaiah 51, 1, it says, listen to me, you who follow after what? So the people to listen are those who follow after righteousness. The people to listen are those who are living a particular kind of life. Not someone living a carefree life. So he, the call to listen was to those who are living a life of righteousness. Who, who follow after righteousness. He says, you who seek the Lord, look to what? The rock. Focus on the rock from which you were healed. And to the all of the pit from which you were what? Dog. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him. I called him. Faith walk is a call. It, it's, it's an individual call. Faith walk is an individual call. It's not a parapet thing. If you're a Yoruba person. Parapet, you know. Uh, now we, now we, now we. It's not. Faith walk is you were called alone by God. You were called alone by God. You were called alone by God. If anything is going to work, 
Is that Tinu? What? Pastor Biro. Wow. So good to see you. You don't understand. This thing dates back several years. Several years. So good to see you this morning. Wow. Hallelujah. You were called alone. And the Bible says to look unto Abraham and one of the things he wants us to see in Abraham is that when he was called, he was called alone. One of the things Pastor Dele has taught us over and over again is that God of the universe, when he was to start the dispensation of grace that we are enjoying today, he started that work with one man. And Isaiah is telling us that we should look unto Abraham because when he was called, he was called what? He was called out. He was called alone. He was called alone. Hallelujah. We should look unto him. Hallelujah. Um, he said, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. I blessed him and increased him. But the first thing I wanted to look at there is that he was called alone. He was called alone. The message this morning is not one in which you receive for another person. Some of you are married. It's possible for you to say, ah, my wife needs to hear this. No, you need to hear it first. You see, the message this morning is not the one in which you said, I'm not married, but ah, I have a boyfriend. We are planning to get married, so let me just receive them. No, receive the message for yourself. For when you find... Your purpose, you will be able to see clearly. Purpose gives sight to the heart. Purpose gives sight to the heart. Because you have been taught here that we do not see with our eyes. You, the only thing your eyes see is are natural things around you. But the kind of sight we are talking about here, it is with your heart that you see. Paul was writing in Ephesians 1, you know, that we commonly quote and all that. He said that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. The eyes of your understanding. Another translation says the eyes of your heart. The eyes of your heart. Because when we, when we talk about sight, as in beholding the invisible, we are talking about the ability of your heart to perceive the things of God. So, you see with your heart. Hallelujah. So, the Bible says he called him alone. You also have been called alone. Hallelujah. Let me show you another scripture. Now, I'm going to exeget, um, I'm going to do a little exegesis this morning, interpretation based on text. It shouldn't be strange to you. Pastor Benro is taking us in the school of ministry, taking us through the rules of interpretation and all that. Romans chapter, let's start with Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter Eight, hallelujah. Amen. Bible says in verse 28, what does it say? And we know. <laughs> and we know that all things work together for good to those who do what? Who love God. You know, a lot of people quote this scripture, they don't love God. But they quote the scripture to support their cause. We know all things work together to those who love God, to those who are what? To those who are the called according to purpose. According to purpose. Because you know the word is, is in the italics. So the original does not include the word is, it just has those who have been called according to purpose. Those who have been called and given specific responsibility. Those who were called and given and have been given specific, uh, specific assignment. But you see, what is important, because later on I'm going to tell you the context in which this verse 28 emerged. But I want you to look at it. It says, those who love God. Those who love God. For us to understand what it means to love God, you have to backtrack and see what is said before it got to verse 28. To those who love God. So those who love God are those who can walk according to purpose. If a man does not love God, there is no way he can walk, discover purpose. He cannot. Bible says that Abraham was called alone. What does it mean? To walk with God as a man. So God began to instruct him. God began to teach him. In other words, relationship was battered the day God called him out of, his, out of everything. 
God did not just call him alone. God called him out of everything. Leave your father, your kindred, everything to a land that will show you. That, that, so you realize the journey of faith is both physical and spiritual. The journey of faith is not spiritual alone. It's also physical. For Abraham lived physically where he was as a result of what God told him. But also there was another journey that, was, that took place in his heart. For instance, it took him 25 years to conceive Isaac. Do you know what was happening? God could have given him Isaac the very next day that he showed up to him. But that, in that work of faith, the man of faith develops. The man of faith matures. The man of faith did not know some things before, but as he journeys with God, some things became God, I mean, became clearer to that man of faith. He, the things became clearer, and as things became clearer, he was able to relate with God better. That is the journey of faith. So it is both physical and spiritual. You've got to know that. But the one that is more important is the journey that is taking place within the man of faith. So he says, we have been called according to purpose. Hallelujah. So maybe this is a good place to ask the question. How many of you, see this question, I'm not going to ask it the way people normally ask it. I will ask it in the negative. How many of you here aren't sure you are doing what God created you for? You are not sure you are doing what God created you for. If you are bold enough, let me see your hand. You are not sure what you are doing now is what God created you for. You are not sure. I'm not trying to trap anybody. <laughs> okay, people are afraid. The righteous, I thought the Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. Thank you. God bless you. I see the hands. Let me ask another question. It's different. How many of you are sure you are the center of God's will, plan, purpose for your life right now? What I'm saying is that what you are doing right now is what God expects you to be doing. Is the exact same place that God expects you to be. And the kind of result you are generating is the result he expects you to be generating. How many of you here are certain that, I mean, aren't certain that what you, uh, I mean, that you are the center of the will of God for you? Is the question clear? Thank you. You think you are certain. Okay, we'll find out. We will find out. Hallelujah. Amen. Anytime the word purpose or the issues of purpose, whether you are reading scriptures or anywhere else you are reading, whenever it comes up, to be able to answer any question around purpose, the first thing to look at is your mind. The first place to check is your mind. Don't think, don't let your mind wander. Don't think about any lofty thing. The first thing that you must immediately analyze is the state of your mind. It's your thoughts. It's what you are doing. I mean, the, the, your, your, what, you, what you engage your mind with, what you think about constantly, what fills your mind at the particular time, that is what you must first focus on because those things will let you know whether or not you are within purpose. Hallelujah. For you see, the purpose of God is to be discovered. Even though he fashioned your heart, our hearts individually. In other words, he put in our heart the things, the DNA of the things that we're supposed to achieve, supposed to accomplish on earth. The things we're supposed to do, he put it and stamped it in our heart. But you see, it is left for us to discover. It is for us to discover. Let me give you an example. In Acts chapter 26, verse 16 that scripture that was made popular during our fasting and praying by Pastor Paul, it was, I mean, God appeared to, to Paul, to Saul, and he said, uh, he said, for this purpose I have called you, can we look at it, Acts chapter 26, Acts 26, verse 16, he says, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, what purpose? For this reason. To make you a minister and a witness, both of the things you have seen and of the things which you are yet, that are yet to be revealed to you. Look at verse 17. I will deliver you from the Jewish people and as, as well as from Gentiles to whom I now what? 
to whom I now send you. Why did he appear to Paul? He appeared to Paul to let him know the purpose for which I've raised you was to take the gospel to the Gentiles. In the course of taking that gospel to the Gentiles, your life will be, your life will be endangered by your fellow men, the Jews, but I will deliver you from them. Specific. Specific. It wasn't given to Stephen. It wasn't given to Peter. It was given to who? To Paul. What was given to Paul? You will minister to the Gentiles. In the course of doing it, you will see several dangers, but I will deliver you from me. That message was specific. That message was specific to him. But guess what? Do you know in the course of Paul's journey to the Gentiles and the things he achieved, he tried to win the Jews. He tried to preach the, to the Jews. Every time he attempted to preach to the Jews, he was opposed. Every time. Remember when he took 12 men. He got to Athens. He found 12 disciples. Disciples of um, Apollos. He found 12 disciples. And he took these 12 disciples into the synagogue and he began to teach them. As he began to teach them, people started gathering together. And as people were gathering together... The Jews became envious of him. And so what did they do? They started blasph- I mean, saying all manner of things against him and all that. They, I mean, the, the opposition was too much. What did they do? He took the 12 men out, took them to a house of one tyrannous, and he taught them for a space of about two years the word of God. And those 12 men and those who were added to them, they turned the Asia Minor upside down. Why? Because the ministry to the Jews was not given to him. The ministry that was given to him was that of the Gentiles. So as long as Paul will be ministering to the Gentiles, he will see results. As long as Paul stays focused to what God has called him to do, he will see results, he will be fruitful. But the moment he turns aside to start doing, adding to the work that God has not given to him, he will meet with opposition. That was exactly what happened. That was exactly what happened. Now, back to us. Every time you experience difficulty, every time you are persecuted at work, when someone seems to be on your case and all that, you've got to pay attention because it, is not the, it might not really be the devil that is doing it. It might be God. Those times that you know it's as if it's so difficult, like people are on your case, writing petitions, doing all, find, trying to find a way to get you out of the establishment. I am not saying you are not supposed to be in that establishment. I'm just saying you need to pay attention. God may be calling you to see what he's doing, to see what he's doing in your life, and you are deaf to what he's doing. So he looks at the things around you that are currently commanding your attention, and he begins to, as it were, attack those things so that perhaps we look up and see him. Perhaps we open your ears to hear what he's telling you. It is not always the devil when things are not working well for you. When business is not yielding the kind of things it's supposed to yield, you've got to look inward because as a believer, you have been called according to purpose. So the natural default state of a believer is to be fruitful. It's fruitfulness. The default state of a believer is to be fruitful in all his engagement. The default state of a believer is to have make impact wherever and whatever he's doing. So when the necessary results are not coming, you've got to step back and ask yourself why. You've got to probe. You cannot allow it to slide. You see, a man who is... um, So the purpose is to move from Abuja to Lagos. I want to travel from Abuja to Lagos. Hallelujah. And I need to get there on time. So I look which transportation company or whatever would get me there fast, faster than others and all that. I'm going to Lagos. When I get to Lokoja and the guy veers off and started facing somewhere else, I will either alight from the vehicle or ask him, what are you doing? Okay. Why? Because focus makes you to know whether or not you are on course. Focus makes you to know whether or not you are just doing things, boxing the air like one who is aiming at nothing. Purpose is what makes you to understand the meaning of what is going on around you. When the Bible, Paul was writing in Colossians, I think is it 1 verse 4, he was talking about Christ Jesus. He said, in him all things consist. You see that word consist, if you want to spread it, he said, in him all things find their purpose. 
In him, all things find their meaning. In him, all things find their relevance. In him, all things find their definition. So once you are, I told you that in Christ is a dimension in the spirit. So when a man that is in Christ Jesus, when he's experiencing things that he's not supposed to be experiencing, when he's experiencing drought instead of fruitfulness, instead of flourish, flourishing and all that, the man must step back and ask why. Because something is amiss. Something is not working well. Hallelujah. Don't always think it's the devil. Don't bind. Before you bind the devil, find out what is really going on. It might be the devil and you've got to bind him, but find out first what is really going on. So your mind is the issue here above all things. Hallelujah. So look at what Romans chapter 12 says. Romans chapter 12. Last week I touched on it a little bit, but this I want to stay here a little bit to let you see what Paul was trying to communicate to the Romans. In verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by what? By the mercies of God. What do you think he's saying? He was trying to bring true weight behind what he was about to say. He said, I beseech you, therefore. That means he's been saying some things from chapter 1. He talks about the invisible qualities of God. He talks about the fact that sin does not have dominion over us. He talks about how grace has come to us, hallelujah, and as sin abounds, grace also abounds. So he talked about so many things. When he got to chapter, I mean, chapter 12, Paul said, I beseech you, I haven't told you all these things, I, I beseech you, that is, I'm imploring you, by what? By the mercies of God. What was he referring to as the mercies of God? He was talking about the sacrifice of Christ. He was trying to bring weight to what he was about to say. So he's saying, I beseech you by the mercies of God. That is, for a second, can you pause and focus on the sacrifice of Christ? Can you pause and look at the weight of the sacrifice that Christ made on your behalf? Hallelujah. To bring you to where you are. And look at what he said. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as living sacrifice. Now, this won't make sense if he had not used the word mercies of God. So the reason why you should present your body as sacrifice, that sacrifice is referring to that message of God. The message of God talks about the sacrifice of Christ. The things you were deserving, you were deserving of death. Because the soul that sins must die. You were supposed to die. You were not supposed to make it. Hallelujah. But Christ came and aborted that. Christ came and he stood in your stead and then he paid for it. And the Bible, Paul was now writing, he said the same way he paid, you also must do what? You also must present your bodies as living sacrifice, only acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, all the things that Christ has accomplished for you, he has become your righteousness, he has become your holiness, he has become your salvation. He said all the things he has done for you, you must begin to now live it out. Because he didn't say God is the one that will present you. He said you should present yourself as a living sacrifice. In other words, you should lose your life and embrace his own. You should lose your life and embrace his own. You should lay down your ambition and pick up the ambition of Christ. You should lay down your own plans and your own purpose because it's only the purpose of God that will stand. He said many are the thoughts in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's will, the Lord's plan, the Lord's purpose that will prevail. That is, that we, that we give the satisfaction that you are experiencing. Because a man can walk in his own purpose and achieve a lot of worldly goods. He can achieve a lot of results, what the world calls results. But it does not mean the man is working according to purpose. That's the reason why the guy who has a lot of money will be envious of a, of a man who doesn't have anything, but is in purpose. Do you get what I'm talking about? Because at the end of the day, when you have everything and your soul has passed beyond a survival level, what you begin to look for is purpose. And I can prove it to you. I hope I'll be able to come back to what I was saying before. Some years back, I watched this documentary, The Men Who Built America. And when the competition started, Dale Carnegie, give me the names, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, eh? JP Morgan, okay, those ones came later and all that. When they started out, it was a competition of who uh, who can make most money. That was how they started. Who can make most money? Who is going to become the richest among all of us? 
Stiff competition. Monopoly was heavy. But guess what? I think it was General Admiral, is it Vanderbilt? I'm not sure, that died first. Somebody died first. When that person died, all of them together, they changed their focus from just chasing material things. They began to ask themselves questions. Why are we here? Are we just here to make money and die like this? So guess what happens? Today you have a lot of universities, universities in the U.S., including, I think, Harvard, and so many other institutions abroad, they started putting money, endowment, they started putting money down to, to start pursuing legacy, they started putting something. I'm not saying they are Christians, I'm just telling you that even a natural man knows that when he gets to the end of worldly goods, he begins to ask questions, why, what is the sense? I mean, he wants to make sense of everything that is going on. Hallelujah. He wants to make sense of everything that is going on. So back to our scripture, he says, present your body as a living sacrifice, only and acceptable to God. Only and acceptable to God. He said, this is your reasonable service. In other words, it makes sense for you to do these things. Because Christ gave his life for you, doesn't it make sense for you to reciprocate what he has done? What he has done? Now, I'm not saying you can, by your good works, get righteousness. No, you have received the righteousness of God. You have received the holiness. You are holy. In the face of God, when he looks at you, he sees the perfection that is in Christ Jesus in you. But he's saying, as you live among men, don't just say you are the righteousness of God. Live it out among men. That is your reasonable service. It makes sense for you to live that way. Because if you are righteous, then live like a righteous man. Hallelujah. But that, that is not where I'm going. Verse 2 says, And do not conform to this world, but be transformed. Metamorphosis. Be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. The word transform means to renovate. Renewing of your mind. You become a different person. You become a different person. He said be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But it does not stop there. A mind that is renewed, Paul said, there are certain things you are going to, that that mind will be able to do. That mind will be able to do it. Remember, we are trying to discover purpose. Why am I here? Paul says to discover purpose, the first thing to do is to renew your mind. Look at what he says. Renew your mind that you may be able to prove. When your mind is renewed, you will be able to determine. You will be able to find out. You will be able to uncover the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The will of God talks about the plan of God. The will of God talks about the purpose of God. The will of God talks about the intention of God. The will of God talks about what God is focused on. The focus of God. He says the moon, that the reason why you do not know whether or not you are in purpose is because your mind is defective. He said the moment your mind gets healed, you will be able to uncover what the will of God is. See, it's very easy for me to come here and to give prophecy. But let me tell you a secret this morning. No matter how beautiful that prophecy is, it is meant to confirm what the Lord has told you. No matter how deep, no matter how descriptive, I can begin to describe your the, the color of your singlet and yesterday and the kind of shoes that you wore, how that you mistakenly wore the right on the left first before you corrected it to just show you that I'm speaking accurately. It does not matter. When I give that prophecy and it's not confirming something in your heart, you see, the conviction, the, you want the conviction needed to bat what has been prophesied will be lacking. Because prophecy is meant to confirm something in you. We are not living in a dispensation where God speaks through, the, through a medium. We are living in a dispensation, what did I call the culture we are living in? A culture of what? Habitation. Not visitation. The culture that used to exist was the culture of visitation. God visits men. He doesn't live, but the culture of habitation is living on the inside of you, instructing you from within. Because the Bible says the future you are looking for, the things you are desiring and all that, they are not coming from outside. They are flowing from your inside. Out of your belly will flow rivers 
source of living water. So when a man stands on the poopy and he says, this is going to happen to you, this is going to happen to you, you are nodding and you are praying because you have seen the same thing that the man of God is talking about. Let's say you have not seen those things. You must take the word you have heard and begin to search the scriptures and begin to pray until you are able to see the same thing you heard. If you are unable to see what the man said, you had better discard it no matter how beautiful it is. Because it cannot operate itself. It is when you see it that those things will come alive. Hallelujah. It says, so that you may prove good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Let me quickly say this. It wasn't talking about three wills of God or three plans of God. The will of God, according to Paul, is good, it's acceptable, and it's what? perfect. Now, imagine a believer is able to uncover the perfect will of God. You don't know what that means? That means the guy is walking with precision on the earth. That means the, the guy is not wasting time. The Bible says that there were many widows in Zarephath, but Elijah was not sent to any one of them, but a particular widow. That's what we are talking about here. In John chapter 6, chapter 7, Disciples, I mean, brothers of Jesus said, ah, the feast is taking place. Anyone that is doing the good work that you are doing does not hide himself. Go to the feast. Jesus said, to you, every time is right. To me, the time is not right. He waited for them to go. After a while, Jesus dressed up and he went to the feast. If he had gone before the time, perhaps they would have killed him on the way. Before time. The plan of God will have been aborted. So a believer has been fashioned by God to walk with precision. Not like a man boxing the air. No, a believer has been designed by God to see the target and eat it. Not let us throw punches all around. Let's throw punches. We, never, we don't know. It might eat. It might just eat anything. No, it will eat it. Before you get back there, it has moved. Hallelujah. A believer is precise. A believer is precise. Hallelujah. A believer is precise. So let us assume that you are someone who has been focusing on your mind. You have been developing. It will take time. But you have developed this habit of focusing on the things you think about. Of renewing your mind with the word of God. And then you have been able to realize that this is my purpose. I am where God expects me to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Now. The fact that you are doing what God has called you to do does not mean you cannot still miss it within that purpose. This one is hard, but you've got to listen. The fact that you have discovered purpose. For instance, Pastor Tokwe is supposed to be teaching and is supposed to be in Abuja. It does not mean that I cannot miss the kind of message God expects me to teach on a Sunday morning. Am I in purpose? Yes. But am I teaching this morning what I'm supposed to be teaching? The answer may be no. Do you get what I'm saying? So the fact that you are in purpose does not mean you cannot still miss some things. Let me illustrate it for you. So a pilot takes over, um, uh, 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 what do they call this thing? Airliner? Is that what it's called? Oh, aircraft. So a pilot is in the aircraft and then he wants to take off from Abuja to Lagos. So what happens is communicating with the air traffic control, right? And he said, am I clear for takeoff? They say yes. And then the guy, I mean, taxis the, the, the aircraft to the wrong way, and then off they go. They're in the air. And they maintain communication with ATC, with, with air traffic control. And then they continue to move following a particular course that has been given to them by ATC. Do you get what I'm saying? Imagine at some point... They lose communication with air traffic control. What begins to happen? That plane, there are so many possibilities. The plane can go off course. The plane can be heading towards Calabar <laughs> instead of Lagos. The plane can be going towards having a on collision with another plane in the air. Disaster and doom is what it will spell out. So, for there not to be any mishap, for there not to go off course, for them not to go off course, a constant communication must be maintained with air traffic control by that plane. 
even though everybody knows, everybody in the plane knows, we have just left Abuja, we are going to Lagos. They, according to purpose, they are correct, they are in the right place. They are going to the right place. But the moment they lose communication, they can veer off. The moment they lose communication, they can veer off. Let me give you this example. So Paul knew he was sent to the Gentiles, right? So Acts says they wanted to enter, what's the name of this place? Phrygia? Who knows that chapter? They tried to enter into Bithynia, I think. The Holy Spirit forbade them. Were they in a Gentile nation? Yes. Was Bithynia a Gentile nation? Yes. But the Holy Spirit said don't go in yet. So the fact that you are in purpose does not mean you just cut off. Since I've discovered my purpose, let me just pilot my affairs. A lot of people do that, but I'm telling you, it will still be disastrous. It's as terrible as a man who has not found purpose. I tell you. It's as terrible as that. So how do we ensure that we maintain our lane? That we don't veer off course even within purpose. Romans chapter 8. Did we read Romans chapter? Okay, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. There's a lot of stuff in Rome. Romans. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8. Um, we're going to read from verse 26. Romans chapter 8 from verse 26. Are you there? Look at what it says. It says, likewise the Spirit... Ah, okay, I will bring context later, but let's read this. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself, himself make, makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Verse 27. Now he who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the, what the, what, what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercessions, intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now let's break it down. Verse 26 says, he said the spirit also helps. Now the first thing you have to learn in staying in purpose is that the spirit is your helper. Of course, we know this. But Paul is emphasizing it. He said the spirit helps our infirmities. Who has the infirmities? Not the spirit, but you. Okay? It's important what I'm saying now. He helps our weaknesses. Now, the weaknesses he's talking about here, there are so many weaknesses. You can be physically weak. You can be mentally weak. It can be, I mean, weakness can be anything. But this one talks about that intellectual uh, 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 not being able to reason some things out, not being able to have understanding of certain things, when you get to your wit's end, he said the spirit also helps our witnesses, for we do not know, that is we are ignorant, we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. You know why? If I'm in purpose, if I understand this is what God, exactly what God wants me to be doing at this time, I, there's no need, I can pray. I can pray. But he's saying it will not always be like that. Or God came here and was telling us that we say God is good all the time, but we don't, it does not always happen that way. Sometimes we know within our heart that God is good all the time, but we won't say we know it in our heart, but the, our reality is say, ah, this one God, I can't say it. Because it's as if God is not good. Though you know God is good. Hallelujah. But everything within you is saying, uh, uh, is God really good? Hallelujah. This one says, we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The question is, how does this happen? Does it mean that when I get to my wit's end, I should just relax because the Holy Spirit is somewhere with the Father making intercession for me? Is that what he's talking about here? The key word there is the word groan. If you go to verse 23, it says, not only the, uh, verse 20, 22, 23, it says, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with bad pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also 
have the, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves, we do what? We groan within ourselves. The groaning is done by us. There is something imminent that wants to happen. There is something that we know in the horizon for all these things to be happening. God is up to something. But we can't see it. We can't see it yet. So what do we do? We, I mean, we groan. This groaning does not mean what some believers do. <clears throat> That's not what this scripture is saying. This growing is actually something, a conflict as it were, that is going on within your heart. It's going on within you. You know God is up to something, but you can't see it. You know something is about to happen, but you don't, you can perceive it, but you don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. And several of us have gotten to that point. He says at that moment, when you don't have any um, any intelligible words to describe what is going on within you. He said the Holy Spirit takes what is going on within you at that time and he takes it before God. He said the Spirit comes because the word used here is the Sonata Lambano, Lambano Mai, someone who comes alongside to help. Okay? So he's talking about the help of the Holy Spirit. What I'm trying to show you here is that the man who is doing the praying it's not the Holy Spirit. It is the believer who is doing the groaning, who is doing the praying. But who is supplying how he's praying? The Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. It is not the Holy Spirit alone who is groaning for you and all that. The Holy Spirit is not outside of you. It is within you. The Holy Spirit is within you. The Holy Spirit is within you. He's a culture of habitation. He is within you. So when the Bible says he helps your infirmity through groanings that words cannot utter, it means that engaging with the Holy Spirit can bring you to a dimension where you are engaging with God beyond words. Beyond words. You are silent. You, are, you know something. They say, Bad pangs, like somebody who wants to deliver something. But you cannot tell the nature of what is to be battered. So you stay in there, but one thing you are assured of is that the Holy Spirit is helping me in this process. So you stay in there until it is, that thing is battered. But look at what it says in verse 27. It says, now he who searches the heart. Now you see the convergence of Trinity here. You see the convergence of Trinity? Because the one who he, ref he refers to here as he is actually God. He said, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. According to the will of God. Now, can you give me message translation? Message translation of this scripture Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 26 and 27. Romans chapter 8. I think there's a little clarity that this brings to the discussion. 26 and 27. Hallelujah. Yes. He said, meanwhile, oh great. He says, meanwhile, the moment we get tired, tired in the waiting, <laughs> God's spirit is right alongside helping us along if we don't know how or what to pray it doesn't matter he does our praying in in and what and for us in us and for us through us let me add that one making prayer out of our wordless sighs our aching groans and our aching groans he knows us far better than we know ourselves knows our pregnant condition and keeps us present before God. That is why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. Every detail is worked in our lives in love with God is worked out into something good. Let me put a caveat here. The person we are describing this morning is not that lazy believer who cannot remember the last time he prayed. It's not the lazy believer who does not engage the word of God. It's not a lazy believer who is not always trying to find out what will God have me do in this situation. What will God have me say in this situation? What will God have me plan regarding this, uh, this thing? 
It's not a lazy believer. It's a believer who loves God. What does it mean to love God? To love God means you are in devotion with him. He called you alone. The only evidence we have that you love God is that you are always praying. The only evidence we have that you love God is that you fellowship with his word. That's the only evidence that we have. But a believer who is not engaging in read your Bible, pray every day, read your Bible, pray every day, does not love God. He says it with his mouth, but he doesn't really love God. That man should not think that we walk at the center of the will of God for him. It's not possible. Mark my words, it's not possible. It's not possible. It's not possible. Hallelujah. It's not possible. Because the way this thing happens is that you engage with him. Remember 2 Peter chapter 1, is it verse 2 that I, we, quoted, we looked at last week? He was saying grace and peace be multiplied according to the personal and intimate knowledge of God. You don't get that by a casual reading of the word. According to intimate and personal work with God. It is not what pastor said. You take what pastor said, you get back home, you open the scripture, and you begin to make that conversion to happen. Because no matter how beautiful the message is, in fact, sometimes they, okay, let me not go that way. No matter how fantastic the message is, if you do not convert it from a second-hand information to first-hand, it won't profit you. It's just what pastor said. Pastor said, pastor said, pastor said, pastor said, you are just parroting what somebody else said. It must become what God told you. It must become your conviction. It must become what the Lord tells you. Hallelujah. And this thing comes by the word. Don't think this is far-fetched. I've said only two things today. Number one, if you do not know whether or not you are in God's purpose, what is the antidote? What is the pill? Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Focus on your mind. Focus on your mind. Renew your mind. Exchange the lies of the devil. Exchange the lies of this world. Replace it with the word of God. Let the word of God dwell richly, richly, richly in your heart. Let it dwell richly. So when the word of God starts dwelling in your heart, your thoughts will be altered. Your choices will be altered. Your perception and your focus will be altered. You will no longer see what you used to see. You will no longer think what you used to think. You will no longer embrace what you used to embrace. You will embrace another. And that another is what God has battered in your heart by the word of God. And by the time you are living that way, you will live in purpose. I'm telling you. Don't be searching. Don't go. What you are looking for in Shokoto is here. Is here. The problem is believers are lazy. Believers are lazy. I don't know about you. Sometimes today, this evening now, I will watch several services across the nation. I do it also. I pray for the congregation. But I realize that it's, not, it's good for us to bless the people. I tell you, there, there, there's a place for that. But people love it when you just pray some things in the name of Jesus. Accident will intelligently avoid you as you embark on that journey. Amen. But to study, what has the Bible got to say about my safety? Which scripture talks about my safety? Uh, I, I don't know. But pastor said, <laughs> accident will intelligently avoid me. We are partakers of God's grace, of the same grace. I'm not saying that cannot work for you. But I'm telling you where God wants you to be is a place where you know God for yourself. The work of faith is personal. It's a personal walk. It's a personal. Let that sink into your heart. It's a personal walk. Then secondly, the fact that you are in purpose does not mean you cannot go off course. How to remain on course is what you call, what you call prayer is to maintain communication with God. You stay with God. In other words, a man of purpose cannot be offline. A man living according to purpose is always online. It's always online. It's always online. For if Paul were to be offline, he would say, God has given me a task to preach to the Gentiles. Phrygia, here we come. Pamphylia, here we come. Meanwhile, the Holy Spirit had forbidden them from going into those places. But you are offline, so you can't hear. But you are online. They wanted to get in there. He forbade them. Can I say this? Let me tell you this. It does, Bible didn't tell us how this happened. He only said they perceived it. 
You know, it's possible that they had a dream. You know, it's possible that as they were making preparations for that journey, things were not working well. The person who was supposed to send the money from Corinth did not send the money <laughs> for them to take the ship. Do you get what I'm saying? Because somebody is asking me this money, Pastor, how do I know God is forbidding me from doing that next thing? He may not say, my son, my son, my son, that thing you plan to do, don't do it. It may not come that way. All the opportunities around you, it may block them. And then you are forced to look what is going on. What does this mean? Remember what I said earlier? For a believer, nothing happens by chance. A believer was carefully crafted by God that there is nothing like happenstance in his life. I'm not saying he should take life serious. I'm just saying he pays attention to everything happening around him. The jokes, the serious things, the mundane things, and the important things. He takes note of everything. He takes note of everything. Why? Because he knows that he needs to be online all the time. Who knows that joke is what will bring the next thing. Open up something in my heart. For this morning, I was there just ruminating. And then Pastor Femi said, for we were wonderful. He quoted that scripture in um, Psalm what? 119 or something. I don't know. He quoted that scripture and something lived within my heart. And I began some other things started coming. Hallelujah. Because I planned this differently. So what I'm saying is that the leading of God is not always God whispering something to you. It might be by the things happening around you. You have scheduled that by so-so time, I'm supposed to leave this country. In fact, there was a man of God, as at the time he was talking, he had over, he has close to 30,000 people in attendance. Well, let, me, let me know how he did, because he said it openly. Reverend Sam, I hear me. He had done everything to go to the, I think, UK or something, to relocate. Everything was right. Everything, every, he had followed the procedures. Everything was complete, but it was denied. He got so devastated. He was like, what is this? Imagine if he had gone to the UK. It's possible he would have started ministry, continued ministry, because he had pastored Rome, Rema, Rema Chapel before. But maybe it would just be one ministry in the corner of nowhere. When you get to the end of the world, just turn left. That is where their church is located. But imagine that. God had to block that. Now, he didn't know at the time. It was painful. It was painful. No chastisement of the present is what? It's joyous. It's painful. Or God came here and was telling us that endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. What do you think? He gives you a command. It's difficult to obey. A man insulted you, abused you, cursed you, and then you went back I'm like, I will have nothing to do with him again. God said, um, how much do you have in your account? 5,000. Uh, package it. Lord, that's the only thing I, I, I know. Package it. Put it inside a nice envelope. No, that envelope is not nice. That one is smoother. Take, remove this one. Put it inside this nice one. Go and give it to that man. Eh? The guy cursed me. The guy abused me. When you are at that crossroads, just know God is up to something. A lot of believers don't know this. When you are prompted to do things that do not come to you naturally. You must be convinced that something is at stake. I mean that God is working out something. I'm telling you. People do not, believers don't know that it is adversity that actually announces us. Adversity announces us. A man of God whose ministry is all over the world now, a Nigerian, said we moved the headquarters from Nigeria when Nigeria became so uncomfortable for us to put our program on TV. They moved to SA, moved to US, moved to UK, spread all over the world because of the adversity they were, uh, that was going, things that were, they were enduring in Nigeria. But believers who are faced with some the chastisement of the Lord were said, devil, remove your hand. It's not the devil. It's not the devil, it is God. It's not the devil, it is God. It's time you get serious with what God is trying to accomplish in your life. Let me tell you this, without missing words, there is a specific thing that God has called you to. When you wake up and then you don't get these things by talent, because a lot of people said, you know what, it's so simple. Pastor said, we should analyze everything around us. So when I was growing up, my mom told me that I love to dismantle our radio and put it back together. So they knew I would be an engineer. That, that is human philosophy. For if you want to go by that, I have, there is no reason I should hold the mic and stand here. Those who know me well, I'm, I want to cringe and hide my face. I don't want to talk. 
I go to meetings, I don't say a word. I just observe. So when I get back to the office and I, and I write my report, they're like, ah, you pick all this and you didn't see anything. I had to learn how to be talking in meetings. When I realized that promotion depends on you being able to shift. What I'm trying to tell you is that it is the Holy Spirit that begins to instruct you. And as he's instructing you, you are becoming another person. He said you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. The change begins to occur within. Because on the outside, you don't have everything it takes to do what God wants you to do. But the transformation begins on the inside. And as you get transformed, he gets you to a point where God said, this guy is ready. And then the things begins to flow. It begins to flow. And then people wonder. Ah, where have you been all our lives? God hid you. He was preparing you. He was getting you set. At the appropriate time, he launches you into the world. Hallelujah. Never again in your life say, I don't understand the purpose of God for my life. It is a declaration of, of, um, of laziness. A believer who says, I don't understand if I'm, at, if I'm at the center of the will of God is just telling us that he's lazy. You know what? Because what we want to hear is that, ah, I want to understand. There's something that, you know, believers say things like there's something. I don't know what it is, but something is, is offering. What that man is saying is that God is up to something. And I'm trying to keep in step with him to understand what he wants to do. Not that he would be saying, I don't even know, I'm, I'm confused. Uh, I, I, not anymore. Not in 2019. In 2019, you are eating target. In the name of Jesus. Can you rise to your feet? You see, in 2019, your eyes are seen. In the name of Jesus. You are not only hearing the word of God. You are seeing what God wants you to do. Exactly in the name of Jesus. You see, your testimony is like the testimony of Moses. The Bible says, see that you build everything according to the pattern shown you on the holy mountain. You are called according to purpose. So what God is doing now is that he's showing you what he wants you to do. He's showing you. To some of us, he wants to expand you. Hear me. Listen to me. He wants to expand you. On the night, the crossover night, I told us. If your dream is too... It's just about this nation and things happening in your community and around you. Your dream is too small. Perhaps you have not heard from him. Because if God is the one supplying it, it will start small. And because the nature of the kingdom is that it is expansionary in nature, it will continue to grow. So it starts in Jerusalem, it spreads to Judea, and then it moves to the uttermost part of the earth. So the things God has put in your heart has the ability, the ability to spread and cover the entire earth. What can you undo right now? I am not saying you should confess your lust. I am not talking about confession of lust or confession of wishes. I am saying the Bible says renew your heart, find purpose. Haven't find, found purpose, you stay with God in the Holy Ghost and then bad pangs begin to come up in you. You begin to sense that I'm about to give back to something and then you see God to show you those things. As he begins to show you those things, they form your confession. Confessions are not declarations of wishes. They are not declarations of just your mere intentions. They are declarations of what God has shown you. They are declarations of what God has shown you. They are declarations of what God has shown you. And I tell you, the Bible says, you can do nothing against the truth, but for it, that thing God has shown you that you will accomplish within your purpose is the truth of God regarding you. Nothing can truncate it. Nothing can subvert it. Nothing can introvert it. It stands. It stands. It stands. Someone is saying this morning, I will just finish my, from law school, I just pray they post me to a nice place. Let me find a good chamber and just join. Perhaps they will be lenient and just pay me some things. That, that is too small for what God has called you to is bigger than that. It's bigger than the entire law school. Not to talk of you dreaming of where you're going to serve. I want you to seek him. 
download into your spirit what he wants you to do for that is where your fruitfulness lies that is where your impact lies that is where your visibility lies that is where it lies there is more that God wants you to God wants to do there is something I called the deficiency or the disadvantage of being so gifted where you can do so many things it becomes difficult to submit to God it becomes difficult to let go of the brilliant ideas you have come up with and embrace what God is downloading into your heart I am telling you what you can see is too small what you have planned for yourself is too small let go of it present yourself as a living sacrifice lay down your ambition lay down your own goals lay down your plans discover what he has for you and then you begin to plan according to what he has shown you because he's not going to build for you at the end of the day you are the one that will build but he wants you to build according to pattern he wants you to build according to the pattern he has shown you on the holy mount what are the men and women he has revealed to you i've shared this with you i see big people i engage them in conversation but that is it but you see since the beginning of 2019 when i see the less privileged the guy picking things from the garbage the guy wearing dirty clothes and carrying stuff something tells me talk but that is who you've been sent to for this year you are to speak to them you are to talk to them i cannot walk by them and just do as if i didn't see them it's not possible not in 2019 what is it that he has also tell told you to do in 2019 different from what i've been doing from previous years what is it what is it i've told you my own see 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 them these are this is your constituency this guy is within your constituency talk to them you have a word for them you have a word for them this guy the gate man this guy just roaming about this guy perhaps plotting to pick somebody's pocket and see if he could get dinner to eat in the night these are the ones god prompts my heart what has he prompted your heart to do so what i'm teaching you this morning is real you must find it you must find it you must find it You must find it. What a grateful lot I lift my hands to you. Proclaiming. Proclaiming, Lord, you reign. What a grateful lot. What a grateful heart I lift my those hands up. Proclaim stop. Lord you reign. Stop. stop, 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 stop. Now, I don't get it. How can my mouth say with a grateful heart I lift my hands to you and my hands are down. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your with all your with all your your body, your mind, your soul with all your being you love the Lord your God how dare you say with a grateful heart I lift my hand with a great it doesn't make sense to me I don't know it doesn't make sense to me it doesn't make sense to me it doesn't make sense to me with a grateful heart come on hey! with a grateful heart with a grateful heart come on let's do it with a grateful heart, I lift my hands to you. Proclaim me, proclaim it, Lord, to you. Reign. One more time, church, with a grateful heart, come on, lift up your hands. Hey. With a grateful heart, I lift my hands to Proclaim
What a day. What a word. Before you sit down, I want you to do something. Just turn to your neighbor. We'll say something to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, the words spoken here, they are alive and they are living. So if I am not in church on Sunday morning or most importantly on a Wednesday evening, waiting again. Thank you very much. You may sit down. Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. How are we? My name is Morris, and um, in less than five minutes, I will just be taking the announcement for the week. Please, um, we have um, offering envelopes on our seat. Please, you may package your envelope. You may package your offering. And for those that want to give, we have other uh, various means of um, giving to the Lord. We have um, the POS is at the back. Then, if you want to transfer, the account will be on, will be shown soon. But um, if you're sending a transfer, if you're writing a check, remember the baptizing is released. Okay, the, the account number, it's um, on the envelope, on the offering envelope. Um, I'm seeing some fine new faces here this morning. And um, there are some set of people I want to recognize. Please, if today is your first time here or your second time in this place, if you're worshiping with us for the first time or second time, please, can I see a show of hand? I saw some new faces, yes. Wow, 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 wow. You're not in the midst. Um, we prayed for you and you came. Now, what happened was that before you came, you see these people here? They are the best choir you have in Abuja. And they went, they went to the best recording level. They call Air Clemento. And remixed a very fine song for you. So please, stand up. Do us, please oblige us, stand up. And they are going to welcome you with that special song. At the end of the service, there's a brother behind, Brother John. Please, he will take you to our welcome center and he will tell you much about the church. Thank you for coming and God bless you. Likewise, I also want to welcome our followers online. We have a mass followership online and I want to welcome them. Thank you for staying with us today and God bless you. Quickly, our weekly service remains the same. Our weekly activities remain the same. Sunday, um, we are here. Workforce resumes 7 a.m. And the School of Ministry, of course, we know we're in we're in, we're in session. And um, School of Ministry, for those that don't know, is um, our own Sunday school. It resumes by 7.30. And, of course, prayers, 8.15 a.m. And um, on Wednesdays, we're here by 6 p.m. We're here from 6 p.m. Wednesdays is different because what you've heard here on Wednesday, we'll now break it, we'll dissect it. You have opportunities to ask questions and then make contributions. The offerings, are they ready? Okay, let's pray for the offerings. Father, we thank you for the privilege to give. And we pray, Lord, that out of this little you've given us, we're taking this to give to you. And for the abundance you've given us, we're taking this little to give to you. We pray that whatever this will be used for is accomplished and is fulfilled in Jesus' name. For the quickly for the rest of the announcement, one to yes last week um, we shared the forms for the budget partners. If you're not in church last week, please try and see the ushers after service. The budget partners form is out. 
of course, but for people that don't know, we run an open budget. What we do at the, ev at the beginning of every year is we come up with budget. Each department and each unit come up with the budget for the year. And then we'll go to an open house where we'll look at those budgets and then criticize it and then pass it for use. Now, and how we fund those budgets, we have various forms. And part, one of, part of um, the f uh, funding of those budgets is the budget partners. And we encourage everybody to be part of it. Uh, we also encourage social media participation. Of course, a lot of these things you've heard, they're online, and soon they will share them. Please help us to distribute them to your friends um, on WhatsApp, on all the social media platforms. We also want to encourage, like Pastor said, we know that this is our year of growth. So we also want to encourage evangelism in every sphere. Remember that anywhere you are, everywhere you are, you're a man, of, uh, you're a man or a woman of influence. So part of that task is to evangelize, is to bring people to churches, and outreach for you. In any, we don't take it for granted, so we believe that anywhere you are is an outreach. Yesterday we were at the law school. Law school guys that are here. Yes. And um, thank you for having us yesterday. Maraba guys, we saw what you guys did yesterday. Yes, please, let's, let's appreciate them. What they did yesterday was also fantastic. Then NYSE, we have for Uni Abuja and several other places we are working on. I also want to remind us that we have a robust and responsive welfare team. But um, please, if you have any in need, please try and ask for Pastor Paul after service, and um, they'll take it off from there. Of course, last week was um, this. Oh yes, last week was a week of um, a lot of good news, goodies. Um, first and foremost, there was an addition to the fold. The family of Mr. and Mrs. Benson had a ba bouncing baby boy. I guess boy or girl, yeah. Yes, and um, God bless you for that. We've been waiting for that baby since January, since December. <laughs> but thank God it came out last week. It came. Um, yesterday, okay, before, let me take this before I take that. Um, the burial, the call to glory program for Sister Bisola Owa's dad is out. Um, the funeral arrangement has been announced. And um, Thursday, January 24th is the wake keep. Friday, January 25th is the funeral service. Um, we will share the details on the platform, on the church family platform. Yesterday was, um, <laughs> yesterday was Pastor Paul's birthday. <laughs> and, um, and, um, ah, God, <laughs> it was fun. If you didn't come, you missed. And trust uh, Cynthia. You know, when you have a wife that went to all these culinary schools and stuff like that, <laughs> she was feeding us with a lot of things. And um, as well, but Pastor Paul is someone that we love so much. Even the law school had to appreciate him. And law school, thank you very much. Pastor Paul was actually wowed when I met him. Was, thank you very much for that. And I also want to celebrate everyone that is celebrating his birthday, his or her birthday this, this month and your anniversary, next Sunday we're going to recognize you, we're going to cut cake for you, and we're going to dance for you. So just know that next Sunday is your day. Quickly, let's stand up and um, recite our mission and vision before we close. So you repeat after me. In the baptizing church, we're a generation of believers who are in full identification with the persons, purposes, and missions of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and who use such identification to influence people, nations, institutions, and systems. That's why in the baptizing church, we are raising persons of influence. Please, anywhere you go this week, try and be a person of influence. Touch somebody, reach somebody. God bless you. See you on Wednesday.